Great, so I think we'll start. Hi everyone and welcome to our second session of the day. My name is Caroline Crawford and I'm a grants manager here with Rosa Fund. We're really excited to begin this second session, which will focus on what it means to be a feminist leader and why it matters. Today is chaired by Evelina Spenson and Tebusum Rashid and features panelists from Women's Resource Centre Feminist Leadership Training Programme. The Feminist Leadership Program is one of Women Resource Centre's most popular programs, and there's never been more of a call for feminist leadership than in 2020. This session brings together last year cohort to share what feminist leadership means to them and how organisations can centre its practices in their work. Before we kick off, there's a couple of things to note. The session finishes at 12.50, and that's in time for the next session that begins at one o'clock. And this session is also being recorded for public viewing at a later time. And finally, there will be a short comfort break halfway through. Now, if anyone has any questions, please add them to the Q&A box that is the bottom of your screen. Um, and the questions will be addressed by both chairs in the second half, where they will try to answer as many questions as they can. But due to time limit, apologies in advance if we can't answer all questions. Please do introduce yourselves in the chat. We'd love to know who's here. I really hope you enjoy the session and I'm pleased to now hand over to the chairs. Great, thank you so much, um, Caroline um, and Rosa for inviting us. Um, we are really pleased to be here and for me and Tebs to be chairing the session together with the absolutely fabulous uh, panelists who are our feminist leadership alumni now. Um, so we're just going to do like quick introductions and then really hand over to, to the speakers. Um, but just to say quickly that um, my name is Evelina. Um, I am the development manager at Women's Resource Center. Uh, and Women's Resource Center, if you don't know us, we are a national umbrella organization for the women's sector in the UK. Uh, we strive to give a voice uh, for the women's sector. And we do this in a variety of ways, uh, including policy and partnership work, but then also a lot of capacity building work, which the feminist leadership training falls under um, and which I have had the absolute pleasure and privilege to be uh, developing and designing together with the wonderful Tebs, uh, who I will let introduce herself. Thank you, Evelina. Hi, everyone. Morning. Well, first of all, I've got to say I'm really, really privileged to be here speaking to you all. Um, but also to say that I've been so proud of being part of this journey with Evelina and the Women's Resource Centre for the last three years. We've delivered feminist leadership in different guises um, over the, you know, the, the, the three years. And I think up till now, we've, we've supported about 500 women in different shapes, you know, from short sessions to the three-day versions to the longer versions. Um, the program, the, the 2021 program, um, which is funded by Rosa, um, we've got the speakers today from that cohort. And this particular program consists, consists of about 18 hours of delivery, um, made up of all sorts of topics. We covered so much in those 18 hours, some deeper dives, some kind of touching the, the edges. But we covered topics such as burnout, power, well-being, emotional intelligence, unconscious bias and interrupting bias, negotiation, presenting, relationship, you know, the list goes on. Um, and for myself and Evelina, you know, I think the beauty of the training, not just this cohort, but the way we delivered this and designed this over the years, is that we have played on each other's strengths. We have kind of consciously been always kind of looking at the modules and reviewing our material, listening to the women. Um, and for those of you that have attended any of our training, you know we love our tools, right? So we're constantly looking to develop new tools, to make it practical. We are very solution-based. We're not prescriptive in our approach. Um, and, you know, in terms of like, if a couple of people asked me, so what's so good about this training? Well, I've got a blur on Trump here, but, you know, it is as you and I, in terms of how we deliver, how we engage, how we look at the women in the room. I think with the four cohorts we had even this time, each cohort had a different set of personalities. The emphasis was different, the approach was different. And you and I um, were able to read the room, even if it is virtual, and actually like listen to the women. And also, um, we try not to be prescriptive. As much as it is about giving knowledge and information, we're not prescriptive because in terms of our approach, that feminist approach, if we were prescriptive, 
it ends up being almost patriarchal because we're telling you what to do. But actually what we're doing is equipping you, empowering you, giving you that sense of confidence and ability to kind of um, adapt what we're sharing, what we're learning, what we're kind of um, engaging on. From the 2020 programme, just to kind of give you a flavour of kind of how it was received, 91% reported increasing confidence in the ability to manage their organisations and others using feminist principles. And that was for myself and Evelyn, it, it's those kind of things that keep us going and keep us motivated. 98% increased their knowledge about what it entails to be a feminist leader. And for us, this is cool because that conversation about what is feminism is different for each and every one of us here in the room. And having an understanding of what that is for me personally, rather than a textbook definition, I think in itself is empowering. 87% reported that they were more confident in taking leadership positions. Quite a few women have come back to us and shared with us, actually have now gone on into a role which I might not have considered before. So those anecdotal kind of case studies, again, really, really powerful for us and sort of giving us that ammunition, I suppose, to keep us going and fired up um, and passion. I myself, just to say, I've worked in the charity community sector about almost 30 years. Um, love working in the kind of women's sector with Women's Resource Centre and Rosa. I'm um, working for a race equality charity, Black Training Enterprise Group, deputy CEO. So my whole world and my passion is this whole world around social injustice and um, inequity. So for me to be part of this journey and working with the wonderful women we have from this year and years previous, it's a true privilege. So thank you. I'm going to hand over to Evelina. Um, thank you so much, Tebs. Um, yeah, I mean, every year we do this training, I am blown away by the amazing women we meet. Um, it's just so incredibly empowering for me uh, as well. And to just be able to be allowed into the room with you all. Um, I do appreciate that. And I feel like really privileged to be in that uh, room. And just to, something to say about like feminist leadership. So for us, feminist leadership is it's good leadership, right? It is to be brave. It is to be radical. It is to be solution focused and to speak up and stand up for oneself, but also others. It is to lift other women up. It is to engage in honest self-reflection, daring to show vulnerability and to make mistakes. There is a lot of responsibility uh, on those in leadership roles. The style of someone's leadership the way she builds relationships or manages conflict uh, and motivates others is paramount to, um, to organizations. The leadership impacts the organization, its presence and its future. Leading by example is not only useful, it's crucial. Um, I do, a, like, you know, we do a lot of training and we hear quite often like the frustration of the women in the, in the team here uh, feeling frustrated about the lovely well-being policy they have, but that the senior management team isn't following it or um, uh, so like the leadership we have needs to not only talk the talk, but to also walk the walk. And like I said, the feminist leadership program has really shown me the strength in women. It has shown me that when you put women together in a room with a common cause, there is very little that can stop them. The power of the sisterhood is profound. And we aim to facilitate a safe space uh, of support and solidarity. This training is about doing things differently and to challenge traditional and stereotypical masculine notions of leadership. It's about transforming and deconstructing our understanding of leadership whilst exposing and uh, challenging masculine ideals and biases. Essentially, it's about creating, living and acting upon a leadership style that is transformative, inclusive, adaptable, transparent and powerful. In other words, feminist, right? Um, an empowering leadership style may be one of the most radical and transformative acts of resistance that one may engage in. So without further ado, I will hand over to our first uh, speaker, um, who is uh, Lioness Tamar, uh, who is a member of the group one of our feminist leadership cohort. Uh, and she will be sharing her uh, personal story. So over to you, Lioness Tamar. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted and um, Evelina. And thank you very much as well to Rosa for this fantastic opportunity. What I'm going to do, I'm going to just screen share so I can. Uh, we can share. OK, just checking I've got permission to share. Yep, I do. So just bear with me. Can everyone see um, the presentation? Yep, okay. Okay, so we just need to go. Oops. Okay, so my talk today will be about the journey into feminism and beyond. Um, I am a, I am Linus Tamar. I am an author, trainer, and speaker. Uh, I'm the co-founder of my uh, organization called the Linus Pride CIC. I'm the founder of the Lioness Circle, which is a specialist support service for uh, women and girls survivors of domestic abuse and sexual violence, um, pre predominantly from the African heritage uh, community. Um, and I'm also uh, part of the feminist leadership uh, program for 2021. I was in group one. So here is my uh, presentation. So, being a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, rape and domestic abuse, I've been rebirthed as Linus Tamar. I empower other female survivors of domestic abuse and sexual violence in London, particularly those born of the African and Caribbean heritage. And you can read more about my story and the work I do in my book called The Lioness Uncaged, which is available on Amazon. But today, I'd like to share with you my journey into feminism and beyond. But before I do, I would like you just to take a moment and really think about what does feminism mean to you? Are you like the women in my training group where before joining the feminist leadership program, some thought about it, some thought about feminism as empowerment, whilst others associated it with more kind of negative stereotypes? Well, don't worry if you too thought of feminism in any negative way. I confess, I thought it was a distraction to my people and our journey of freedom since slavery. So what change? Well, the feminist intersectionality and leadership program happened. It's a training program developed by the Women's Resource Center and was delivered by two of the most inspiring feminist leaders, Tebs uh, Rashid and Evelina Swevson. Now, if you allow me, I'll take you on a little journey to show you why I now can fully identify and embrace myself as a feminist leader. You see, for many years, women have felt trapped in relationships and life in general because of fear, guilt, emptiness and hopelessness bestowed upon us from men in this patriarchal society. Now ask yourself these questions. How many times have you been told that you are less than or not good enough or simply passed over for another? How many of us are still hoping to muster up the courage to leave a particular relationship in pursuit of having a better life for us and our children? How many of us have lost ourselves in relationships because we were younger or blindly loved or just didn't know who we were? 
Have you ever just given to something because one person thought that they had a right of which part patriarchy tells them that their right is greater and must be adhered to? Well, no more. I have learned that feminism is about equality, respect, and solidarity. I have learned the skills and tools necessary to be a great feminist leader. I've learned about project management, negotiation, unconscious bias, and so much more, as Tebbs has outlined. And I am reminded that I have rights that are neither greater nor smaller than yours. So today, feminist leaders all over the world are saying, no more anger, no more tears, no more discrimination, no more racism and oppression, no more being stepped over, no more controlling or coercive behavior, no more physical abuse, no more sexual abuse, no more rape, no more FGM, no more honor-based violence, no more abusing our children, no more ignoring the needs of us and our children, no more disrespect, no more powerlessness, and no more hopelessness. Why? Because enough is enough. So let's make a stand. Join me and all those fantastic feminist leaders in taking back your power, reclaiming your lives, and standing in your very own light. So if I ask you again, what does feminism mean to you now? Would your answers be similar to the women on the leadership, on the feminist leadership program? If you agree with the majority that it's about allyship, equality, solidarity, and intersectionality, why not take a stand with me today? Make a pledge to yourself about how you too can better embrace feminism and help lead the world in becoming a better place. Make a pledge today. I am Lioness Tamar, and I'm leaving you with the healing power of love and light. To get in touch, please see my contact details on the screen. Thank you very much. I don't like, I don't know what to say. Uh, that like I just feel like okay, we're off. Uh, thank you so much, Lioness Tamar. Would you mind? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's um, that was incredible. I feel like I'm out of breath and I didn't even say anything. Uh, <laughs> um, there's some great. Um, uh, oh God, I'm struggling to find my words. Thank you so much, Lioness Tamar. Um, that was amazing. Um, look at the uh, uh, comments in the chat. Um, wow. Uh, again, what a privilege it is to to have met with you and know you, and to be able to, you know, call me my call you my friend and colleague. Um, whew, okay, great. So we're off then. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, as uh, I think Caroline said earlier, if you do have any questions for any of our panelists, just do uh, post them in the Q and A, and we will have a look at them uh, uh, during the break specifically and pick out them. So yeah, thank you so much, um, Lioness Tamar. Our next speakers are Kieran and Olivia from uh, Group Two, who will speak about uh, imposter syndrome and unleashing our feminist leadership potential. So over to you, uh, Olivia and Kieran. Hello, thank you, Evelina. I'm just going to share screen. Hello, everyone. 
um thank you thank you thank you um uh i don't know where to start from but uh uh tips has already given the graduation uh, i think certificates and the results so we are all passing and uh, i just add would like to add one sentence just from my personal experience uh, the program was run in a very safe and supportive environment. Um, myself and uh, Kiran, we are, we are in, uh, selected by the group two and the, to represent the group two. And the group two is considered to explore some of the constraints to leadership. So we hope by the end of our presentation, you'll all be empowered towards being a feminist leader. So this head, the topic for our talk is unleashing your feminist potential. Next slide, please. Uh, we're going to look at a the first idea, which is imposter syndrome. And this is an internal feeling of being a fraud and that you're going to be found out. You always feel insecure and that your success is unwarranted, undeserved or unearned. You feel that you don't belong or you are not as good as others perceive you to be. You feel that your opinions, your thoughts and ideas are not worthy of being heard. And this experience has nothing to do with your skills, your abilities, your knowledge, talents, or even competence. So I just want everyone to think about that. Have you ever felt like that in your day-to-day -day life? Just give it a thought. Now we have to look, we're looking at who experiences imposter syndrome. Anyone and almost everyone experiences imposter syndrome, but is particularly prominent among us members of underrepresented groups. Like women, we are always told by society that we do not belong. However, the biggest ally you have is your mind. So please stop be feeling inadequate because when you decide, you can. You are you, and that's your superpower, and that's what you bring to the table. So hold on to that fact that you deserve what you have, and you're good enough to be where you are. If we look at the statistics, it shows that a man with only one or two qualifications will find it easier to apply for the same job than a woman with six qualifications. So men have shown confidence, but women are told they are always aggressive when they try to show their confidence. So I want everyone to see your own value and put yourself out of that comfort zone. 75% of executive women report having personally ex experienced imposter syndrome at certain points in their careers. And 56% have been afraid that they won't live up to expectations or that people around them will not believe what they're capable, that they're capable as expected. And how does imposter syndrome really manifest? Imposter syndrome will prevent us from applying for jobs and programs where we would excel. For example, if women apply for only 20% fewer jobs that's than men according to a LinkedIn study. Imposter syndrome prevents us from sharing ideas and reaching out for help because you always feel you might be wrongly judged. Imposter syndrome, it reduces our power to negotiate for better working conditions and we fail because we fail to hold the necessary conversations with our line managers. Imposter syndrome impacts our self-esteem and self-image, hence the less we contribute we fail to value our strengths and strategies. The team always loses on your expertise and loses your input. 
on being on better working practice for everyone. Imposter syndrome, you can't believe it that even famous and intelligent people like Maya Angelo, Albert Einstein, and Tina Fey have experienced it at some stage. So this is a proof that imposter syndrome is not rooted in fact and is not a reflection of your actual talents and abilities. And now I'll hand over to my colleague Kieran to talk about what would have in our feminist tool board. Over Thank to you, Olivia. Kieran. Thank you, Olivia. Hi, I'm Karen. So I'm talking about what's in your feminist toolbox and what tools do we need to be a feminist leader and how these can be used to overcome imposter syndrome and unleash your feminist potential. So first of all, the definition of a feminist leader is someone who challenges traditional and stereotypical masculine notions of leadership. Feminist leadership is about transforming and deconstructing our understanding of leadership whilst exposing and challenging masculine ideals and biases. I think historically and traditionally, leadership has sort of devalued qualities that are associated with women and feminist leadership seeks to uh, subvert that. Feminist leadership is not just for women, it's pro-women. So some qualities of feminist leaders, I'm not going to read them all out, um, non-hierarchical, inclusivity, compassion, caring, emotional intelligence. I don't think they've been historically associated with leadership, but I think they are very, very important. And I think, and I hope everyone can recognise some of the qualities on this list and say that they've got them, you've got some of these qualities on this list, but no one has every single quality. Everyone possesses different leadership skills and qualities. That's why we're all equally as important as each other. You're not here by mistake. You're here because you have skills and abilities that are needed. Um, so we're going I'm gonna focus on two skills in particular. The first one is emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence is defined as the ability to understand and manage your own emotions, as well as recognize and influence the emotions of those around you. There's four core competencies. So the first one is self-awareness, which is at the core of everything. It describes your ability to not only understand your strengths and weaknesses, but to recognize your emotions and the effect they have on you and your team's performance. That, which that leads on to self-management, which refers to the ability to manage those emotions, particularly in stressful situations and maintain a positive outlook despite setbacks. Um, people who are good at self-management can intentionally respond to stress and adversity and not react in an unpleasant way. Third one is social awareness. It's important to understand yourself, but you also know how to read the room and manage the emotions and dynamics within your team. And the fourth one is relationship management. So relationship management is your ability to influence, coach, and mentor others and resolve conflict effectively. And all those four core competencies together is emotional intelligence. And I think we can all agree that it's really, really key to being a good, effective leader. And emotional intelligence accounts for nearly 90% of what sets high performance apart from peers with similar technical skills and knowledge. The second one is non-hierarchical. I think this should underpin feminist leadership. Um, I like this quote from Charlotte Bunch who said, society has tended to mystify leadership skills as somehow belonging only to a few people who are then seen as better than everybody else. But if we view leadership skills as something that many people have to varying degrees, skills that can be built upon, supported and enhanced because they're needed in the world, not in order to make one superior, then we might have a better way of dealing with leadership. And I think that's been really key in submitting those traditionally masculine notions of leadership and to reduce imposter syndrome as well, to say everybody is valued, everyone is equal in their ideas, and this isn't a one person at the top, everyone else below me. Um, you don't have to be the loudest in the room or in the most senior position to be a leader. I think every and any self-identifying woman can be a feminist leader. So to round off, um, I think we can say who is the feminist leader and I hope everyone knows the answer to that. Feminist leader is you. You. You, you. Are, you are a feminist leader. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that's the end of our presentation. So thank you for listening to us and I'll, share, I'll stop sharing and hand back over to Evelina.
Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Karen and Olivia. Gosh, I'm just like loving this. Like this is, uh, oh God, how lucky am I to be able to work with you all. Um, brilliant. You know, um, you know me by now and like how close I am to Tia. So I think I'm just going to hand over uh, and say thank you so much, uh, Karen and Olivia, for that amazing presentation. And I will hand over now to our next speakers, who are Nisha and Andiola from Group 3, who will speak about what a feminist leader, leader looks like and why it's different um, from our traditional notions of leaders. So over to you, Nisha and Adiola. Thank you, Evelina, and thank you to um, the previous panellists. Um, that was amazing. So I hope to follow in that same um style um but yeah we just wanted to echo uh the previous panelists about recognizing the importance of feminist leadership um so my name is nisha i've been in the vogue sector the violence and women, violence against women and girls sector for about six to seven years um starting as a frontline worker and working my way into uh, management roles so currently um i'm um deputizing um as a service manager in a national domestic abuse charity. And um, Adiola and I are really pleased to be with you here today um, as we both have a professional and personal passion. Um, so thank you all for joining us and I'll hand over to Adiola. Hi everyone, I'm Adiola and um, I work at Kairos Women's Plus, which is a women's organization in Renfrewshire, Scotland. So my experience is in the criminal justice uh, sector and mental health and evaluation. Um, just to apologise, I'm trying to share to full screen, but it's not allowing me um, with this setup. So apologies for that. Um, we'll try and send out the slides uh, after so that you can see that. Um, so before we start, I'm just going to um, explain what we're talking about. So today we're going to talk about what does a feminist leader look like? Uh, a quote that uh, really touched a lot of uh, the women in our group is by uh, Batlawala uh, and she's a social activist and a scholar of women's rights and she has uh, said that feminist leadership will strive to make the practice of power visible, democratic, legitimate and accountable at all levels and in both private and public realms. Cool. Should we go on to the next slide? Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm just trying to go to the next slide. Sorry, everyone. It's not. I think my screen has froze. So whilst um, Adiola is getting that up for me, thank you. Um, the next slide sort of goes on to talk about what a traditional stereotypical um, leader looks like. And generally when we're speaking about a leader, um, if we're looking at stereotypes, we're looking at someone that's a white male in a senior position. Um, and, you know, they would have um, leadership qualities like a top-down approach, potentially um, quite domineering within the work field. Um, and traditionally, loyal followers that are just um, following that approach. Um, so the reason we want to introduce feminist leadership and talk about the qualities of um, what a leader looks like is that we're looking at things from an intersectional lens. Um, and, you know, a lot of the structures that we do have, um, the institutional structures, they've not been set up for women like us to be in these spaces. So, um, you know, when we are looking through an intersectional lens, we're looking at many different things, such as uh, taking into account race, culture and class, not just of your staff, but also um, of your service users that you're um, delivering services for. So let me just see if we can go into the next slide by any chance. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Evelyn, for starting that out. Sorry, everyone. Um, so uh, one of the main qualities that uh, we feel is essential to good feminist leadership is emotional intelligence. Um, Karen already touched on this, so we're just going to go into a little bit of more detail. So um, emotional intelligence, the ability to understand, use and manage your own emotions in positive ways to relieve uh, stress, communicate effectively, empathize with others, 
overcome challenges and diffuse conflict. So this in essence facilitates our capacity for resilience, for motivation and communication amongst others in order to kind of na navigate different um, so, um, situations. So um, to the left, you can hopefully see a diagram illustrating some of the specific qualities in regards to uh, self-management and self-awareness. Um, so when we're talking about self-management, that's in essence exercising um, a sense of transparency, um, emotional self-control, among other things. However, there is the misconception that in leadership role, you can't show weakness. Um, on the contrary, as feminist leaders, we do feel that, you know, it is actually honest to be, um, it's okay to be honest with those around you, even if that does make you vulnerable. Um, and it allows for a more uh, supportive environment and closer working relationships. Um, we do know that some women in leadership feel that, um, you know, they can't really be honest about their struggles, you know, because they want to protect their team or for any other reason. Um, but we feel it's important to distinguish the difference between, you know, offloading emotions onto people um, compared to just openly sharing, you know, how you feel in a reflective way. When we're talking about self-awareness, um, it incorporates things such as emotional self-awareness, acute self-assessment and self-confidence. Um, and the key point in that is kind of questioning, you know, how do you actually make um, other people feel in the room? Um, so if you're being self-reflective, you will, will be able to develop emotionally and practically, um, which can only benefit you in becoming a great feminist leader. Next slide, please. And then tying into that, um, we're looking at social awareness as well. So um, when we have similar lived experiences as um, women that we're supporting or staff that we're supporting, um, it will only help um, service delivery. So um, if a staff member is able to speak the same language as a service user, for example. And then um, we do need to think about, are we making the effort to work on our unconscious, unconscious biases? Um, and going back to Adiola's point about being self-reflective in our practice. So um, I think we need to acknowledge that again as well within our practice um, and important to recognize these feelings and if it's coming from within ourselves. Um, so again, in the next section, we're going to be exploring how um, some lived experiences can influence how we become feminist leaders. And so through our training together, um, we all became uh, quite close. I think every group was like that. And a lot of us shared our experiences with, with one another. And this really allowed us to reflect on, you know, what are the qualities from a lived experience that actually can make us great feminist leaders? And what does a feminist leader actually look like in practice? Um, so there are a lot of different qualities that we came up with together as a group and um, we're going to touch on just a few of them as examples. So the first one on the screen, as you can see, is resilience. Um, so from our group, um, one of our colleagues uh, shared that, you know, they fled uh, abuse as a child and um, whilst also migrating to another country. Um, and as an adult, they went on to go and then set up their services to support and inspire uh, Black African women. We had another peer that shared with us that she, um, in her previous profession, she had a male disclose to her that he was physically attacking women that were street homeless. So as a combination of that disclosure, as well as looking at inequalities within the provision of mental health um, care, that acted as a catalyst for her to then set up an organization focusing on counseling services for women that are trapped in street-based prostitution, as well as women who have been victims of trafficking. So that exemplifies um, her being empathetic. Um, another peer of ours, um, she was perceived as being inexperienced due to her age, despite an extensive background in financial services. So following her passions, she's now the director of her own helpline to support women and young girls. Um, and it just showed her drive to be able to make that happen and being resourceful in doing so. Um, and then the other qualities you'll see showing up on the slide, um, we, we also think would um, show a diverse feminist leader would be, uh, for example, having foresight, integrity and transparent, um, which should all come up um, in a nice sort of flowy way. Um, but yeah, so much more that goes into being a feminist leader. And these are just a few traits that we thought would be um, important to share. So we just want to uh, have a moment for everyone to just um, reflect and kind of think about everything that's been discussed uh, so far. So a good food for thought that we thought might be useful is to kind of think about a key experience that's influenced your leadership style. Um, and our main point from that really is to um, 
give the message of how important it is to be an ally as a feminist leader. So we believe it's important to recognize that we all need allies to use um, their platform and privilege to work alongside us and advocate for feminist leaders and the benefits of this. Um, another key question we feel is important um, to kind of ask yourselves when you kind of go off um, you know, back to work or in your volunteer roles is um, thinking about how are you already practicing feminist leadership qualities and skills? Um, because there is no perfect leader um, there's always room for improvement. So um, it's really important to continually and regularly reflect on this so that we can all be best, better feminist leaders. Next slide, please. And then finally, we just wanted to end with this quote, um, which was again shared by one of our peers in our group by Adrian Rich, um, which reads, there must be those among whom we can sit down and weep and still be counted as warriors. I think this quote reiterates again that there's authenticity and strength within all of our experiences. And it's a perfect example of how our adversities and the you know, situations that we've been through, it's not just that they frame us as people, but in turn, how those experiences frame our leadership styles. So again, just, an, um, just a note to think about how it impacts your leadership style. Um, and I wanted to thank Adiola, want, Adiola and I wanted to thank you all so much for joining us for our segment and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks everyone. Thanks for sticking through that, those technical difficulties. <laughs>
rules or community agreements that we created together in our group in group four and so we were all part of the rosa um, sorry the rosa and women's resource center feminist leadership program and we were from all over the uk different seniority levels and um, some of us just at the beginning of our career some of us in the middle some of us going into leadership positions we're all from different backgrounds different ethnicities different life experiences but we all managed to come together online in a safe and supportive space. We didn't know anything about each other beforehand, but what um, the, the safe and creative space that we created together and our desire to um, learn more about feminist leadership really helped us to come together. So if I read some of these, out, uh, these uh, skills or traits out to you, and um, they're basically rooted in feminist leadership. So the first one was confidentiality, respect, respecting different types of knowledge, experience and backgrounds, ensuring everyone's voices are heard, active listening and empathy. And everybody stuck to these throughout. So on the course, we experienced a lot of empathy and collaboration, and we had many chances to, pra uh, to practice uh, feminist leadership and consolidate our collective learning. So we had lots, we did lots of different exercises. And one of these was looking at leaders in our own lives and seeing the qualities in them that we admire. So this could be friends, parents, colleagues, mentors, volunteers that we work with and people in our everyday life. So we drew upon and recognized the good qualities in them that wouldn't traditionally be seen as being leadership qualities. Um, such as empathy, reflexivity, kindness, sensitivity to others' needs, as you've heard in the previous presentations. And we also did some interesting activities where, for example, we had a task. It was we had two minutes to deliver an elevator pitch presentation about something that we were passionate about and events that impacted our lives. And we we gave uh, our two-minute presentations to our group, and we had such supportive and amazing feedback that was accepting and non-judgmental non-judgmental and um, we also had the chance to discuss challenging situations and discuss our values boundaries and share some very specific and personal learning experiences so i'll just take some water <laughs> So one topic that we focused on greatly was about power and power and leadership in general. So when we think about power, we usually think of it in a hierarchical structure where someone is at the top of the triangle and we're all underneath them. However, feminist leadership subverts this and puts everyone on an equal platform. And the goal of a feminist leader is to challenge and expose visible and hidden power in our everyday lives. So there can be different expressions of power and it's about dissecting and constantly evaluating these forms of power that we experience. So we start with our own space and look at the simple and small things that we can do every day to support others. So um, as Evelina and Tabs mentioned in our training, this could be something really small, such as who makes the coffee at meetings, who chairs the meetings and who is allowed and invited into certain spaces are we seeing and recognizing the ability and potential of every person to act and looking at our personal agency and capacity to change uh, create change allowing everybody to have the power uh, allowing everybody to have the chance to grow and develop so we need to continuously be thinking about our power and our personal relationships with others and recognizing um the different intersections of power. And this quote by the Women and Girls Network is really nice. It's, to be empowered is to be resourced internally with self-worth, confidence, and externally with skills, opportunities, and resources. <laughs> so if we look at this, then um, feminist leadership is essentially holistic. So it's not just something that stays with you in your nine to five job, instead it ripples into every aspect of your life into everyday life it's about the power within ourselves and understanding power structures from the inside to the outside so as you can see in this diagram it begins with us and um, it begins with reflexivity emotional intelli intelligence so the awareness of yourself how you carry yourself empathy for others strengths weaknesses and confidence and then it goes into your um into your personal spaces so with your family neighbors friends and communities 
that you interact with and you look at those around you and your interactions with others and see their strengths and the ways in which they can be supported and this also carries on into the workplace as well or any organizations that you volunteer for or where you're a trustee for and then into the wider world as well you make so feminist leadership then if you practice it within yourself and you're constantly reflexive about it it will ripple out into everything that you do and basically when it's done in harmony um uh, sorry when it's when it's when it's in practice feminist leadership produces a lot of harmony and it's a holistic way of experiencing and working in the world so this is a quote that we also came across in our course and it's by Sri Lata Batiwala Batliwala and it's basically I define feminist leadership as a process of transforming ourselves our communities and the larger world to embrace a feminist vision of social justice it's the process of working to make the feminist vision of a non-violent, non-discriminatory world a reality. It's about mobilizing others around this vision of change. So feminist leadership is transformative, it's horizontal, and it's practiced by anyone in an organization. And it's all centered around empathy. So it's about putting yourself in the place of others. And it's something for all genders to practice. And as um, I think Kiran also mentioned this, um, and it shows how important it is, but it's not only for women, but it's pro-women. So when you start from the perspective of women, everybody is included. So then if we go on to this slide, feminist leadership is basically humanist leadership. It's a human approach. It's about caring and thinking about other people's lives. It's about understanding power structures, empathy, reflexivity, and how they all complement each other. It helps us to understand our peers, the wider audience, and understand our own place in society. It's about valuing all those attributes that might have been seen as a weakness. And whilst boundaries are essential, it's, not, it's about not expecting your team or those that you work and interact with to leave themselves at the door and put on a face or a mask. So um, somebody in our course um, really encapsulated uh, feminist leadership in a very, very short sentence that I thought was quite beautiful. And they said that um, basically uh, feminist leadership is a caring practice that empowers. And that is a very inspiring um, short phrase, which is um, just incredibly beautiful. And yeah, so as Linus Tamar and everybody else also said, and you've had a chance, I hope you've had a chance to continuously reflect when you've been hearing these presentations, um, now that we've gone through what feminist leadership means to us, what does it mean to you? Maybe you can leave this session today and start thinking about how you can embody practices of feminist leadership in your everyday life. And um, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Amazing. Well done. Well done, uh, Sidran. Thank you so much for that. That was incredible. Um, wow, you women, what, I am so impressed by you. I'm so grateful to be in your presence, you and the groups. Um, this has been fantastic. Um, I think we are, <laughs> I think we deserve a little bit of a break, like just stretch our legs a little bit and then we'll come back for the Q&A session. So if we can come back here just before half past, so uh, 12, 20, uh, 29, <laughs> that's not much, uh, but yeah, five minute break. We'll have a look at through the questions, have a bit of a stretcher, have a glass of uh, water, do what you need to just, um, and for you uh, who's watching and listening, if you have any questions, do post them in the Q&A box and we will uh, review them and we'll come back. Let's come back here at half past 12.30. Yeah, great. Okay.
All right, we will be starting to come back. Um, that was um, really powerful, I think. Um, so much said by our incredible uh, speakers. We have about 20 minutes now um to uh um to do some questions and answers um so um i've got the questions here i don't know tips would you yeah, yeah I'll, I'll i'll try and navigate this thank you everyone for being here thank you for the questions that have been posed we'll try and get through some of them and looking at the panelists i might look to you um for a contribution, um, but I'll be more than happy to get to those last. So we'll start off with the one around, uh, there's one question or, or statement, I suppose, about feeling lonely at the top um, in, the, in that position of power. Uh, I'm trying to find it now. Oh, here it goes. The big issue for me is uh, as a social enterprise leader, it gets lonely. What are your thoughts on that, please? So yeah, it can be lonely at the top, especially where you know the, the paycheck is taken over. So I'm, I think I'm going to go. I'm looking at Nisha for this one. What are your thoughts on this? Um. Yeah, I completely agree. I think everyone is, um, the more that you're sort of um, developing and you're progressing within your career, um, everyone does feel that way. And again, it comes into play, like, should I even be here? Like, do, do I deserve to be here? But I think um, what in the current organization I'm in, um, I have had a colleague that set up a, um, a group where managers are able to sort of have a space to talk about um, working practices or sometimes if it's just offload, um, that's been really helpful. I think um, part of my role, I moved around quite a lot within the organization. So I was meant, I was able to link in with um, different types of managers. Um, but, you know, I think that if you are able to link in with people, I'm not sure if what type of um, organization or the size of um, the place you are, um, but if you are able to link in with your counterparts, it really, really helps, even if it's just to offload one day. Um, it doesn't have to be about anything work related, or if it is, you know, if you're trying to sort of bounce ideas off each other, that's really helped me anyway. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else wanted to add to that. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll definitely echo that. It is that reaching out. Uh, Line us tomorrow, very quickly, if you want to respond to that. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I, I completely agree uh, with what Nisha says, but also I think for me personally, within the, my whole structure, it's been breaking status quo, um, you know, setting up my own organization, like coming out of corporate and setting up my own organization, using my lived experience as a survivor and empowering other women uh, that's been through similar things. And the more I do, the, like setting up a, a, a peer support network, now it, you know, it's a common thing now, but when I did it back then, it was something that was hardly available, especially for black women and girl survivors. So breaking the status quo as feminist leaders um, uh, and empowering other women to, you know, to, to stand in their own light, it can be very, very, very lonely. Um, but apart from what Nisha says, the one thing I would suggest is uh, be clear about what your vision is. Um, and once you're clear about what your vision is, just keep focus on that. But definitely, yes, you know, get the support around. And if there isn't a support group in your organization, set up one. Yeah, yeah. And, and many of us are on LinkedIn and things like that. So, you know, reach out, have that chat and it doesn't have to be a relationship forever but it might be a moment you think you know what i might just reach out to one who's in a similar field to me um for that moment um so use the platforms that are there now right moving on um one question come up, what resources are available for training young girls to develop as feminist leaders we need to start early really really important um uh, point i think i will go to kieran for this one as the first point of all Thank you, Tabs. Um, I agree. I think we do need to start really, really early because I think socialisation starts from the second we sort of enter this world. And I think there's evidence that shows people talk to baby boys and baby girls differently. So that 
from the sort of second we're born, we're taught to, you know, be a bit less quiet and a bit less behind. And whereas boys are taught to be assertive and have that confidence, have that growth. Um, I'm not sure what we could do, but I think whatever we do would have to be continuous and would have to be sort of because this issue is a societal issue as well. It's not just in terms of organisations, it's schools when they're younger, it's families, it's everything. So I think from when they're younger, I would probably where they are mostly is school. So maybe do something important there and maybe have a yearly thing that trains girls to be more assertive and be more confident and have beliefs in their in their abilities and strengths. Mm, definitely I think as, as women as well um, the more confident we are about this conversation the more we can have them around the dinner table and actually having these conversations in those spaces and then we you know we talk about tools Evelyn and I are constantly sharing tools um, and we love doing that and for us we emphasize that whatever the tool is it could be adapted based on age based on sort of where someone's coming from so there's a whole range of tools and we talk about our toolbox and it's about looking at well, what do we already have as tools as adults that we can adapt and maybe recreate for that younger age group as well so it's really about again that feminist approach about thinking outside the box being creative and not going around the textbook approach that we think leadership is that you get to some age then we learn about leadership but actually no it is about creating platforms for comfortable conversations with with that generation Okay, moving on. Um, sorry, scrolling. Okay, this is an interesting one. I mean, some of these questions are really deep and really, I, I believe it's, it's beyond these kind of few seconds of reacting and responding. So again, it is the fact that questions are being posed, the fact of taking questions and putting other platforms as well. I find it so difficult to control my emotions when I have a disagreement with my male manager or I feel that they've been unjust. I often and very frustratingly feel like my eyes are watering. Um, and I have to fight not to cry. Do you have any tips or suggestions on how to deal with this? Hmm, who should I go to? Olivia, you've always had a very calming effect on all of us. I'll start with you, see what your thoughts are, and then if anyone else wants to chip in, please do. Um, thank you so much, Tibbs, for that great question and for uh interesting me for having something to say um i think the first advice i would give is just uh, that person to first sit back and reflect on her personal like experience and uh, find out exactly look okay about her emotions and the uh, the root cause or, or, or like the the the, the, part, the history because the, most of the time these emotions are um, rooted from our like backgrounds or stuff like that and the, if we don't have to look at that then uh, that's where they really become an issue but if this if that person starts from that and looks at her background and uh, then uh, probably to start from there you can be able to um mm -hmm. empower yourself um uh maybe my other colleagues can add something to that thank you uh, Linus tomorrow and then kieran oh, sorry i think kieran had her hand up first it's okay you can go tomorrow okay thanks um i was just going to add to that i 100 percent agree with uh, olivia um, and sharing just briefly uh, an experience uh, in, in corporate as well, I did find that a lot of, um, you know, the masculine sort of dominating um, uh, micromanagement triggered, was triggering me left, right and centre. But I, I, I knew I was feeling so upset and I couldn't understood or put words to articulate what exactly it was. And I had to do, as uh, Olivia says, that sort of self-reflection. And for me, I found that it was linked back to my childhood history of people in authority to, um, abusing or taking advantage of me and feeling helpless and hopeless then. So it was triggering off those feelings again. And once I was able to identify what this emotion that my managers were triggering off, then I was able to do that in a work. 
to, 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 to address it. And now I can be in different environments of different management and I'm able to not feel as intimidated or, 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 or reactive to their management style because yeah, um, I, I've now dealt with that. So that's, that's just what I was, uh, I, I, I would have added like just echoing um, Olivia's point. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, Karen, very quickly, and we'll move on to the next question. I was just going to say, um, I have similar reactions to the person who posed that question, so I can only speak from personal experience. I think what I would do is, similar to what Linus, Tamara and Olivia were saying, is stop, reflect, breathe, gather your own thoughts and opinions, and then at a later, like, later on, maybe approach those people and say, hi, can I just grab you for a chat? I just want to communicate. I know it was a while ago, but I just want to communicate my thoughts um, clearly and effectively. And this is what I think. And what I often do as well is try to make an educated guess as to what I think their response will be to me, just in case it triggers any further anger. I'm already prepared for that. And um, that's what I sort of do in those sort of situations if it's something that really does need to be addressed. Thanks for sharing that. Anisha, did you want to react to that? Yeah, just a really quick comment to say, like, I think, of course, like self-reflection and all that sort of work we're doing within ourselves are, is really, really important. Um, but I think also if you are having those emotions, those emotions are very valid as well. If someone is just coming at you, um, you know, in an accusatory way or um, being critical rather than constructive, um, having those emotions are still very valid as well. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for those contributions. And again, it's that kind of conversation we could spend an hour on different angles, different perspectives, all valid. Thank you so much. Moving on, um, how to practice leadership skills in a very, in a fast paced working environment. I think this relates to each and every one of us, especially this last year. I think, Adiola, can I come to you? Because I know you, there's a lot going on in your work life. Yes, there's a lot going on. <laughs> um, I would say it's just about, um, just kind of echoing what others have said on, on other topics, is echoing that sense of uh, reflection. Um, because unless you kind of take the moment to reflect, you're not going to really know what's going right and what's going wrong. And um, so I think it's important to kind of reflect and communicate that with um, your colleagues and the people around you, um, just, just to really find out um, how people are feeling about everything. And I think lockdown has um, changed a lot of the ways that, you know, we all work in our workplaces and um, we've all just kind of quickly adapted to the new, new normal and the new way of working. But it's important to kind of, you know, think about what that journey has been like and, you know, what the goals are um, for, for the future. Great, thank you. Um, Sidra, I'm going to come to you as well, only because I know you've just jumped into a new role and there's, a, again, a lot of juggling. You know, how in terms of managing, if you had four time fast-paced environment and you've recently been a student as well, haven't you? <clears throat> so how, how does that work for you? Um, sorry, Kaz, can you tell me the question again? Yeah, sorry. So basically, in a fast-paced working environment, how would you manage that situation? Um, how do you manage sort of leadership in, in a fast-paced um, environment? Yeah, I think I haven't really had um, chances to be a leader, leader. But um, I think reflecting on my um, presentation, I think um, in terms of every day, like when I'm when I'm working or volunteering every day. Um, yeah, I don't know, like, I think just constantly, like Adiola said, reflecting and just taking a step back. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> no, no, that is fine, that is fine. I mean, it is something that, you know, someone's going into new, sort of developing in your career, as you said earlier, it's about being aware that yeah. actually don't let everything take over your life. It's getting that work-life balance. Yeah, yeah, it's I been, think, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I'm um, just taking a step back and then also evaluating everything that you're doing. And I think the main thing that I've learned is like just communicating clearly, like with whoever that you're working with, like what it is um, that if there are any things in other, like if you're, do if you're doing like multiple positions, for example, obviously in the pandemic as well at home, it can be very difficult to manage everything. And then on top mm. of that, you've got like, I think in the COVID-19 pandemic as well, you've got your um, your personal stresses of like life of COVID-19. So I guess you could call that um, the fast, a fast paced life. So it's just, yeah, taking a step back and like um, having the courage to be open and um, like others have said, 
just express what it is that is concerned, like anything that yeah. is concerning. Yeah, thank you. No, that's a really, really valuable contribution. Thank you, Sita. I think it is about looking at organizational team cultures. So wherever you are, that why is that pace so fast? What is going on? Um, what systems and processes have you got in place, not just for a individual or a team, but the organizational cultures to then think, okay, well, how are we managing our workload? What is going on? What is our strategy moving forward? What's our capacity? So as a leader, as an organizational kind of structural kind of process, for me, it is about looking at the bigger picture, but also looking at the forecasting as well. This is something that Evelina is really passionate about. I know with the well-being side and that whole wheel of life thing. Um, I don't know, Evelina, do you want to say something? I just think that like there is always something you can do. Um, it's easy to blame um, like a fast paced environment to get the feminist leadership values at the window. Um, but actually, there is a we all have the power to do something. And like I say as well in the training, you know, we can't necessarily overthrow like patriarchy on our own, but like there is something we can do. And there are processes and policies in place to ensure that we um, still consider our uh, like staff's well-being as a top priority whilst doing our work in that kind of fast-paced environment and of course you know like work will ebb and flow that's just a nature um but are we just sort of um sort of ignoring um our values when it's becoming really stressful um so i think you know there is something we need to um do that we can't just sort of we need to still take that sort of stuff so we're being as a main priority i'm gonna have hand over to lioness tomorrow as her line, uh, hand up thank you thank you and i know we're coming to the end Ugh, but yes <laughs> um i think as a feminist leader one of our main responsibilities is the self-care to ourselves and so having uh having i would suggest like a daily routine of self-care whether that's you know going for a run or for some people it's gym or meditation or nice bath or whatever it is that really uh, relax and empower us to focus on setting our intention and getting on with our day I think that's first and foremost is a is a fantastic start to help us deal with whatever the challenges are going to come for that day but I agree with everything else that you guys have said in terms of the organization itself and that's definitely something my organization is having to mm -hmm. go through um, in terms of replanning and restructuring but one of the things I've, I've, I've found during that process is that sometimes we're doing roles that we're not the best at doing <laughs> and so that can be very stressful and so having the confidence to say actually I think somebody else may be better at doing this role and if you need to recruit which is what we're having to do then do that but yeah those are the two additions mm. I'd like to add to what everyone else says. Great thank you Tamara thank you for that I'm conscious that um, there's one person in the room who's got their hand up Evelina have we got a quick chance to ask Julia Samuels it's a comment do you, Julia do you want to unmute and I'm not sure how this works on the webinar setting I don't know if that mm, I'm not sure if that's possible I think she, um, she'll have to um add her question in the Q&A box because I think um participants yeah. can't unmute themselves yeah. Well, unfortunately, I think we're coming to an end now. Um, so sorry for not being able to take all your questions. I know we've really just scratched the surface here, uh, but you can always, you know, reach out to us and, you know, we are happy to have a conversation with you. Um, thank you so much to Rosa for inviting us. And thank you for all these like panelists, like you are incredible. Like, thank you so much. Um, and I think it helps as well for being like fabulous. So I'm just going to hand over to Caroline now. Thank you so much, everyone. That was a really wonderful session. And like the chair said, just really amazing. And thank you to all the panelists and the participants who've been putting some really nice uh, comments in the chat. Um, so I'll quickly wrap up now. We're right bang on time. So thank you for everyone keeping to their time. And the last session will be at 1 p.m. and it's facing the future opportunities and challenges ahead for women's organizations. So looking forward to seeing you all there. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.
exactly keep in touch <laughs> uh, 